you are in for a uh, you're in for a treat this evening. Um, I'm blessed to be able to welcome Edward A. Lee to Virtual Futures. So my name is Luke Robert Mason, and I'm the director of this thing we call Virtual Futures. So for those of you who are here for the first time, the Virtual Futures conference occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid '90s. And to quote its co-founder, it arose at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Now, whilst it was most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as The Guardian put it, its actual aim, hidden behind the brushed steel, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, the charismatic prophets, and the techno-parties, was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did was try to cast a critical eye over how humans and non-humans engage in emerging scientific theory and technological development. This salon series, and thanks to the Library Club, it now has been a, has been a series, completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. Tonight, we're joined by Professor Edward A. Lee, a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at UC Berkeley, and a self-confessed nerd. His new book, Plato and the Nerd, confronts us with the possibility that digital technologies might be co-evolving with human culture. As Lee himself says, it is a book for numerate humanists and literate technologists, of which I'm neither. Um, above all, it is a hopeful, Book. Elon Musk and others have claimed that AI is an existential threat to humanity, but tonight we might find out the extent to which this would be true, or perhaps even false. We might not be able to control the evolution of AI, but as Edward claims, we might be able to nudge it. In other words, our artificial intelligence will be dependent on us, even as we become dependent on them. So, to understand how we can move towards a symbiosis with AI rather than an annihilation from it, please put your hands together and welcome Edward A. Lee to the Virtual Futures stage. So, Edward, firstly, thank you for being here at the, at the Library Club and at Virtual Futures. And I just want to ask you the first question about the real crux of the book, which is how the nature of human thought has really changed because of technology. Could you explain that core thesis? Uh, I can I can try, Luke. But let me let me start by first thanking you for uh, instigating this. I, I, this is a completely new experience for me. I've never done anything like this. Um, I've actually written several books before, but they're all very technical textbooks, and they're you know, mostly uh, very good cures for insomnia. Um, and I, I really hope that this book is not like that. Uh, I mean, it's certainly, it's been kind of an adventure for me to uh, to tackle this. And um, it's, uh, but this kind of event, I mean, nobody would have ever asked to interview me about my previous textbooks. So thank you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, so I'm sorry. Please repeat the question. So, so the core of the book, uh, the, the core of the book, and and it is an enjoyable read. And I, I haven't read your textbooks for, for obvious reasons by, by the sound of it. But but the, the core of the book is is that the nature of human thought has been changed by technology. So could you explain the crux of that statement? Yeah. So I, that that's actually an idea that has. Um, been around for some time. I mean, I think many people credit um, Marshall McLuhan, for example, for kind of first introducing that concept, uh, you know, way back in the in the 60s and 70s, this idea developed that, that in many ways, you know, technology is really very much an extension of humanity. And the idea was also developed quite a bit further by um, um, uh, philosophers like Daniel Dennett, and uh, Richard Dawkins is one of your fellow countrymen uh, who um, coined the term memes for, you know, these sort of uh, self-replicating ideas that propagate through our culture. And I think, uh, I mean, Daniel Dennett is the one who has really influenced me a lot. He's a, he's a philosopher who's, you know, currently teaching at Tufts uh, University. And um, he wrote a wonderful book recently that I really recommend. It's called... Um, uh, from bacteria to Bach and back again. 
and um, he really articulates this case that um, that human culture, including things that we think of as you know very old and deeply rooted like language, very much shape human thought. And in fact, you know, he claims that human cognition is intertwined uh, with you know these cultural artifacts that are you know the very structure of thought is is inseparable um, really from these cultural artifacts and I think you know I mean uh, Daniel Dennett however doesn't he, he doesn't understand technology that deeply and he, so you know part of what I'm developing in this book is the the story that that technology plays a huge role in this and and a rapidly accelerating role. I, I really believe that our our you know the the very structure of our thought is uh, actually changing in response to technology. I mean, one of the things I say in the book is that Google makes me smarter, um, and I think it really actually does at a very fundamental level. That there's things that I can do cognitively that I couldn't do before Google came along, and I think that's true of a lot of the technology that we're dealing with on a daily basis, and it's also it's changing very fast. I mean, I, I have I have two daughters, and they're six years apart. One is uh, one is twenty one, one is fifteen, and um, I see them the way that they use technology in their in their social interactions is different. In the space of six years, enough changed in the technology that you can see very noticeable cultural differences in their way of interacting with other people. So I I think that. Um, uh, it's the, the technology is having a really profound effect on, on humanity, and we need to understand how it's evolving. That, and that, that was a big part of the reason that I tried to write this book. Uh, you know, I set out with the goal of trying to give, I, I, frankly, a nerd's perspective on um, what is really happening. Uh, and so I, I hope I accomplished that. And well, it's not. It's not just the, the fact that technology is evolving, but it's the fact that humans and technology, as you say, are co-evolving. In in some way, humans are responsible for the evolution of technology. Could, could you explain the the statement that you make in the book? Yeah. So, I'm I'm an engineer, and um, I for most of my career as an engineer, um, I thought I was designing technical artifacts from scratch. I thought that they were things that were coming out of my head that um, didn't exist before, that I could create out of nothing, and um, they would come into existence. And I've realized that actually that's not the way it works. That, um, in fact, everything that I do as an engineer is done in the context of an enormous cultural backdrop and a lot of what I call in the book the uh, uh, unknown knowns. So you, you, you may know, you know, Donald Rumsfeld is famous for, you know, having said there are, there are, you know, the things we know that we know, there are the things that we know that we don't know, and then there's the, the things that, um, that we don't know that we don't know. Well, I'm a digital guy, so when you see two possibilities, knowing and unknowing, and you combine them, there's always actually four possible interpretations, and Rumsfeld left out the fourth, which is uh, the unknown knowns. So the unknown knowns are the things that you know, but you don't know that you know them. <laughs> okay? And we all have them. They're, they're actually a big part of our lives, and they shape our thinking in, in very profound ways. They constrain our thinking. And I think that technology developers don't realize how much of what they're doing is in the context of these unknown knowns. And so, but the unknown knowns are constantly changing. So this is where the coevolution comes into play. So if you see, for example, um, you know, a, a programmer writing a program, right? The programmer chooses a programming language. Where did that programming language come from? Well, that programming language was probably developed by another nerd because it's usually nerds who develop programming languages. And, you know, it might have been 
the, the programming language itself may be kind of quirky. Uh, a lot of them are. They're, they're, they're actually kind of idiosyncratic. They, they have a personality. And um, they were developed in the, you know, against a backdrop of experience that the programming language developer had had with other languages and with his, his or her own programming experience. And um, there's this kind of feedback loop that happens where the, the languages shape the, the thinking of the designers. The designers then turn around and create these artifacts that will you know, become part of the technical backdrop for other people, which will then shape their thinking. And this feedback loop is, I think, more of what's driving uh, the, the evolution of technology than this, you know, naive notion that I used to have that, you know, smart people just designed things from a top-down fashion and had complete control over what the outcome of that design was going to be. I mean, I think most of us simply don't realize how little control we actually have uh, about over the outcome of these things because they are so constrained by these unknown knowns. Well, you talk about technology as the thing that enables this evolution in its own right. You call these things the techno-replicators. So what are techno-replicators, and more specifically, how do they work in order to give rise to what you call in the book a techno-species? Yeah, that's um, uh, you know one of the more maybe outlandish ideas that is probably going to get me into trouble. Um, but uh, it... You know it, this this all this. So let me put it in in relationship to um, Richard Dawkins' idea of memes, right? So memes are are uh, ideas that spread through culture, right? And they they are a big part of what forms culture, according to Dawkins. And he says that you know memes co-evolve with culture, um, but memes are kind of you know the. He, he talks about a Darwinian evolution of memes, right? So, you know, you come up with ideas like fashion, for example, you know, um, fashion choices that people make and they catch on or they don't catch on. Uh, but he, he, he talks about a Darwinian evolution of these ideas. But these ideas, you know, it's really very much kind of an analogy with Darwinian evolution because the ideas can't exist independent of the human brain that carries those ideas. But that's actually not true of the technological artifacts that we're creating, right? So when we create a, when we have a, you think of a technological artifact like Wikipedia or, or Google search, right? It actually exists out there much more independently of human brains, right? It's, it's actually an, kind of an ongoing thing. I mean, it does depend on us, of course. You know, you, we could shut it down, but, um, but we're not very likely to do that. And it's... Um, uh, it, it, it really resembles a living thing much more than a meme does. It's got its own body. It's got its own system of nourishment, right? It gets its nourishment from the power grid. So ultimately, it's you know, consuming fossil fuels and maybe some photons from the sun. So it's got that. It's got, um, it's got diseases, right? It, it gets infected by viruses and has to have... In immune system. So I talk in the book, for example, about um, uh, Wikipedia's defense against vandalism, right? They have uh, artificial intelligence bots that will um, do a classification of your edits of a Wikipedia page. And if this bot determines your edit to be a vandalism uh, uh, of the page, it will immediately reverse your edit, right? So that's an immune system. But, but actually, the immune system for most of these technological artifacts um, involve humans. The humans have to step in to fix the problems with the technological artifacts, and the technological ar artifacts help the humans fix it. So, you know, if you have a problem with your computer, you know, you're getting some error message that keeps popping up, how do you fix it? Well, you Google for that error message, and you find other people who have faced this error message, and Google will tell you what you need to do in order to function as the lymphocyte that's going to protect this, uh, you know, or cure this, uh, this particular problem that this techno species has. So what you start to see is happening is kind of a symbiotic relationship between these uh, processes that are embodied in silicon and software and the humans that are using them. And 
it's not only a symbiotic relationship, but it's a rapidly changing symbiotic relationship where, you know, the, the, uh, um, the computers are helping the humans help the computers, right? They, you know, if you're a programmer, uh, Google is your best friend and you go, you know, you, you use it to, to, to find, you know, chat rooms like Stack Overflow, which is a tremendous resource for, for programmers. Um, I, you know, I personally do a lot of coding myself. I, I like to do that. I, f I find it to be a, you know, a creative release for me. And so most of the things that I create um, are, are techno species that then immediately die because they're completely unfit for the world. But nevertheless, it's a lot of fun to, to create them. And, um, you know, Stack Overflow is, has just fabulously improved my productivity in in programming and i think most programmers would tell you the same thing that the, you know the there's this kind of feedback where the the computers are helping the humans create the the software which is then helping um you know sort of foster this co-evolution one one of the things i worry about when reading your book and hearing these terms such as techno species is whether you're simply anthropomorphizing something like Wikipedia and whether the way in which you describe software code being similar and different from genetic code, whether there's a danger of using biological metaphors to refer to technology, but equally if there's a danger of using, as you so wonderfully raise in the book, this danger of using information metaphors to describe the human brain. There's, there's some issues with these metaphors, isn't there? Oh, there absolutely are. And, and um, you know, uh, Dawkins himself got a lot of criticism for using the uh, the biological metaphors for memes. It was, you know, quite controversial. And he, you know, he he openly says every time he's questioned about it, you know, it it, it is just an analogy. It's a helpful way of uh, of of thinking about what's happening, um, and it shouldn't be taken too literally. But but I, I would say I'm, I'm not so much anthropomorphizing because I think that even though people, there's a lot of talk about, you know, artificial intelligence, I think the, the, the digital techno species that we have out there now um, really don't resemble human beings very much at all. In fact, I, I think we will, before too long, look back on where we are today and think of them as actually a very primitive beginnings of, uh, uh, you know, and, and a process that's going to create some much more interesting, um, uh, artifacts in the future. Um, I, I guess an analogy that I would draw is that they're not so much like humans. They're more like gut bacteria, right? I mean, we have a symbiotic relationship with gut bacteria, but I wouldn't want to anthropomorphize gut bacteria, right? I mean, I don't have conversations with my gut bacteria. Um, and, you know, I don't think of them as humans. I don't think they have animal rights. I hope that, you know, we're not going to have, you know, sort of animal rights movements to protect gut bacteria. Um, but, you know, the, the reality is that, you know, if the gut bacteria are all killed off, we're in deep trouble, right? Same is true of the software, right? If you, if you kill off all the software today, we cannot possibly feed 7 billion people on the planet. Um, can't do it without all that software. It, it simply, it, you know, if you, we would be in deep trouble. Um, so we have a symbiotic dependence, but that's not an anthropomorphic, uh, anthropomorphication. Wow, that's a multi-syllable word. Um, because it, it's, they're not really resembling human beings. Well, let's talk about AI, you mentioned it very briefly, but that's the thing that makes the book so relevant to today. So we're seeing folks like um, Elon Musk, and we had Jan Talon sitting in exactly that chair only about a month ago here at Virtual Futures talking about his fears of super intelligent AI, but you, you're you not so worried, and I just wonder wonder why. Well, I, I mean, at a certain level, I am worried because um, rapid change, particularly rapid evolutionary change um, happens when in the presence of a lot of death, right? That is actually what drives evolution, right? It's a flip side. Survival of the fittest has a flip side, death of the unfit, right? And we see that happening on both the technology side and on the culture side, right? I mean, most 
technological artifacts that created that get created die. Um, that's a reality. We don't feel sorry for them because we don't anthropomorphize them, right? But they do die. And uh, but the cultural artifacts that they're interacting with also die. I mean, we're seeing death of careers, for example, right? I mean, how many people are clerks now? Um, travel agents, uh, you know, in not, the not too distant future, truck drivers, right? I mean, we're we're seeing we're seeing cultural memes in the in the Dawkins sense dying, and so it is that is scary. Um, but I think that uh, it's that the symbiotic dependence is uh, perhaps what will, you know, protect us in a sense that if we, if we, if we keep nudging this whole process towards symbiosis rather than competition. So in, in one of the problems with artificial intelligence is that um, I think a lot of us have kind of a very linear notion of what intelligence is. That we think it's, um, you know, gut bacteria don't have any, and humans have it all. And there's kind of a gradation on a linear scale between those. I think one of the things that we're discovering with AI is that um, actually intelligence is not that simple. Intelligence is actually very multi multifaceted, and um, the question we really should be asking is, is, well, what are the things that the machines can do better than the humans? And the reality is that, you know, since the start of the Industrial Revolution, we've created machines that do things better than humans. And for the most part, it has benefited us, right? We have machines that can lift uh, weight that no human could possibly ever lift, right? And as a consequence, we can build skyscrapers and things like that. Uh, we, we have devices like this one in my pocket um, that can remember vastly more than I can remember. I mean, so, you know, at, in the, in the 19, uh, late 40s, early 50s, when, when, um, at, when AT&T was developing the direct dial system for telephones, uh, they did a human factors study to try to determine how many numbers a human being could, re could retain in short-term memory. Turns out the answer is seven. How many numbers can this device retain in short-term memory? It's a lot more than seven. And you know, remembering numbers is a cognitive function, and we already have machines that vastly outstrip our capability in that cognitive function. There's, I think the thing that is scaring a lot of people these days is that the number of cognitive functions that the machines are getting good at is accelerating. And um, that is nerve wracking, right? Particularly for people who are in careers that might be threatened by that. And, you know, we should be worried about it because, you know, rapid disruptive change always comes with risks. Now, people are scared of the issues whereby AI is taking certain jobs, certain cultural artifacts are, as you say, dying. But you say in the book, and it's a contentious statement, but you say that directing AI to replicate humans underestimates their vast potential. You don't believe it's going to be artificial general intelligence that's going to look in the image and likeness of us as human beings. You think we should let these things be the best uh, cognitive machines or machines that do certain specific functions that they can be and not try and make the aim to replicate something that looks, feels, sounds, cognates like us. Yeah, I, I, I think we... You know, it, it again, you know, when we have this sort of linear scale of intelligence and we think of humans as, as being at, at the pinnacle of that, it, it can be very misleading with respect to, to what the machines can do and what we actually want them doing for us. So one of the things I say in my book is that, um, you know, do I really want to, um, do I really want my car to exhibit human-like intelligence, right? That might mean that, you know, when I get into it in the morning, I have to argue with it about getting to school on time, like I do with my daughter, right? Um, and I don't want to argue with my car. It, it just, it's, th this doesn't appeal, right? It, you know? <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I think that, moreover, that, you know, if we make the, the machines too human-like, 
um, we're probably not going to like that very much. And moreover, they're probably not going to, they're not going to give us that symbiotic value. The, you know, we have seven, more than 7 billion human brains on the planet. Um, that's a lot of human brains, all right? And uh, those human brains are very good at doing certain kinds of things. We have no shortage of human-like intelligence. So there's no particular need to, you know, supplement that with machines. I think what we need the machines to do is to do the things that humans are not so good at. And I think that's been the track record of the technology so far. And if we just, you know, continue to see that as the way that it's going to evolve um, and continue to nurture it, now it's not going to be easy necessarily. I mean, we may have to change some of our social structures, right? As, as certain careers disappear, people get hurt. We have to do something about that, right? And so the society has to adapt. Um, but I don't think that, the, I, don't, I think that the goal of, of simply replicating humans, I think it has a certain biblical appeal. And so people think of it as, oh gosh, that, that, that must be sort of the ultimate objective. We recreate them in our own image. Um, but I don't think we want to do that. And I think that the value that we get from the machines is already, already demonstrably much better than it would be. I mean, if my phone could only remember seven numbers, I will have achieved, you know, a technology that matched the human capability, but the phone would be much less useful. What if, what if the emergence, do you believe there's going to be the emergence of AI in the same way that the last time I've heard the word nerd used in an AI debate is when we talk about the rapture of the nerds, the, the run towards this thing called the singularity, in which case suddenly this thing becomes, um, it will explode. Um, in the same way that the Cambrian explosion happened. And you call it actually something slightly different. You call it the Googleian explosion. And I wonder if that's where the fear of AI comes from, this belief that suddenly this thing is going to exponentially get better and not leave a place for us as humans. Well, I think there there certainly is a lot of uh, fear about that. And, and it is justified simply because of the accelerating change. Right, and accelerating change is scary and disruptive. And um, culture, I think, almost by definition, changes much more slowly, and that can create tremendous risks because our culture may not be able to adapt quickly enough mm -hmm. to the technological changes that are happening. So, you know, th those risks are definitely there. Uh, I don't want to to downplay them, and I think that uh, you know, as people like you know, policymakers need to um, be kind of uh, more aware of what's really happening. In fact, I would say you know, my 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 major goal for this book was try to to try to get a conversation going that was more realistic about what is really happening, how how these processes are evolving, because we can't manage them as a society unless we understand what's going on a little bit better. And to think of it as just, you know, the, the machines are just going to, you know, take over and obliterate the humans. I think that's such a gross oversimplification of what's really happening that it would, it's useless as a mechanism for guiding uh, policy making, for example. I, I don't think it would be an effective mechanism for for guiding policy making. Well, do you think some of the fear of AI comes from that issue of the fact that we think it's going to be in the image and likeness of us and we know our flaws? So the reason we're so worried about AI is that we're worried it's going to copy our behaviors, that we'll be wiped out like humans have wiped out animal species or like Western colonizers have, have wiped out indigenous populations. Do you think AI is going to, treat us with the same, or humanity with the same disrespect humans have treated each other across history? Well, I think it, it can happen. Um, your gut bacteria, for example, may, um, you know, revolt against your body. And there are certain disorders where that's actually what happens and it kills the body. Um, and so that's, um, you know, 
it, it's certainly a risk. Uh, however, um, I think that a symbiotic evolution is actually a very robust process because, um, you know, in a sense, when you have a symbiosis, survival depends on each side benefiting the other. And if you don't have that benefit, you don't get the, the procreation and the, the uh, spreading that, you know, is required to have that sort of Darwinian survival happen. So I think that's working in our favor. Um, it doesn't provide any guarantees, right? But it is working in our favor. Now, I want to focus on a particular passage in the book, which was certainly for me a, a really interesting and unique perspective on the reason why something like human level AI won't emerge. And it was really to do with how we think about the brain. And the passages, if, if you don't mind me reading it back to you, is, is only features that can be encoded with a finite number of bits can be passed from generation to generation according to the channel capacity theorem. If the mind or features of uh, the mind, such as knowledge, wisdom, and our sense of self cannot be encoded with a finite number of bits, then these features cannot be inherited by offspring. It certainly appears that DNA does not encode the mind because the mind of your offspring is not uh, your own or even a combination of both biological parents. You're essentially raising something very tricky about the mind, and it's the fact that even though we want to see the brain as this computational entity and whatever consciousness is, is information processing, in actual fact, it turns out that it might not be. Yeah, so um, uh, Luke is reading from a passage that I consider to be one of my nerd storms in the book. There, there, are, there are passages like that there where the, the density increases, and I've tried to keep them very short, but I, I, I feel like they're, they're pretty important. And, and one of the arguments that I make, so the, the, the book is actually divided into two parts, which I call a yin and yang. Uh, uh, part and the yang, it starts out with the yang part, which is the more, the more positive, optimistic. Um, you know, this is this technology is groundbreaking in the sense that we can do really amazing things that were unimaginable not so long ago. Uh, but the yin part is more trying to counter uh, what I think is a natural enthusiasm and maybe an over enthusiasm that emerges has emerged every time in history when humans have developed a new and powerful technology. So back when, you know, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, um, steam engines were the favorite metaphor for how the brain worked. Hmm. Okay. Cogs and, were turning. Yes. Um, you know, there was a lot of pretty serious writing by fairly serious scholars about how, you know, the, the, the brain was you know, like a steam engine, and uh, it was using these kind of mechanical metaphors. And these days, we're seeing the same thing with with computation and and digital technology, where um, you know people have decided that all of cognition is digital and computational. Um, my sister, who is not a technologist at all, in fact, she's you know has no technical training at all and she asked me one day well you know what is an algorithm everybody's talking about algorithm it turns out everything is an algorithm these days and i didn't realize that it had gotten that much that pervasive in popular culture that suddenly everything is an algorithm and um so you, the whole second part of my book is trying to put some breaks on that and say wait a minute you know Digital technology and algorithms are, are a very powerful tool, um, but we have no reason to believe that they're universal or all-encompassing. And in fact, I, I argue in the book, and I, uh, you know, in some sense, you know, one of the reasons that I say that the book is for numerate, uh, 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 sorry, numerate, um, uh, what it, uh, humanists, numerate humanists and literate, and, technologists. And literate technologists, right? Is that uh, there is a little bit of math in the book because I feel like I have to show that what you can do with digital technology and with algorithms is not, in fact, universal. 
um, that it's fairly easy to show that there are things that are out of scope uh, for computers. Computers simply can't do that. And it's quite possible that many of the things that we consider essential parts of cognition are in that category of things that are simply out of scope. And, you know, one of the, one of the, uh, so you mentioned, you know, the Shannon channel capacity theorem, which is, you know, one of my nerd storms in the book, but, uh, it's a, it's a very famous, uh, result by Claude Shannon who developed it in, um, in the 1950s at Bell Labs. And it was, he, he's considered the father of information theory. And I think a lot of the modern notion of what we think of as what information actually is, uh, is rooted in Claude Shannon's work. But one of the key ideas that, that he developed in this theory is that whenever you're conveying information, that the amount of information that can be conveyed is actually vastly smaller than the amount of information that is contained in the source. And this is because of noise in the channel. There's, whenever you have noise in the channel, which you always have, you know, I mean, when I'm talking to you here, this is a noisy channel. I have ideas in my head and I'm using words to try to convey them to you. And they're entering your ears and your brain and you're forming ideas that are almost certainly completely different from the ideas in my head that are creating these words. There's going to be significant differences in the ideas that form in your head compared to the ideas that are in my head that are generating these words. The words themselves are, in fact, a digital technique. I mean, uh, words are discrete. Um, they you know, come from a finite vocabulary. If we didn't have that finite vocabulary, um, none of you would have any idea what I'm saying, right? It, we have to have sort of this common shared discrete and digital vocabulary in order to accomplish any communication at all. But everybody knows that verbal human communication is tremendously flawed, that it's very difficult to convey you know, significantly complex ideas from just to transport those from one brain to another is extremely difficult. And we know we can't transport them from one generation to the next either, which is specifically what this passage was addressing, right? There's a reason why, you know, every emerging human brain is a blank slate and has to be completely educated from scratch. They don't even have language, right? They, they, we, we start all over with, with every new human brain. And that could possibly be simply because a lot of what is going on in our heads is actually not digitally encodable. So with regards to the substrate independent minds and the idea that we could upload minds into computers, you believe that's, that's not even possible because we just don't know what is going on in that couple of pounds of gray matter. Well, some, some of the, um, uh, singularity, uh, enthusiasts, um, include, I mean, the, the core idea of the singularity is simply the exponential growth in the capability of the machines such that it then vastly outstrips human capabilities. Um, but there's a peripheral idea that is also a part of, uh, some people's thinking in that area, which is that, um, once the machines have that capability that is, you know, significantly more than what the humans have, then in principle, they say we should be able to upload our brains into the machines, our, not, not just our brains, but our self, our, our, our very, the very essence of ourselves, and then become immortal. And um, uh, I claim in the book that um, in order for that to be possible, you have to presuppose that everything about human cognition is actually digitally encodable. And moreover, I show that that thesis that it is digitally encodable is actually not falsifiable. Uh, that there's no way to construct an experiment that would prove that thesis to not be true. Now, this is a little bit of a subtle argument because it, it's, it's resting on, so there's a, a very well-known philosopher of science named Karl Potter who um, uh, postulated the idea that for a thesis to be scientific, 
it must be possible to construct an experiment that would prove that thesis false, right? If you, if you can't imagine such an experiment, then the thesis is not scientific. It can only be taken on faith, is really his argument. If there's no way to construct an experiment that'll prove it false, then you could accept the thesis, but you have to acknowledge that you're accepting it on faith. You're not accepting it on the basis of scientific evidence. So that's, so that's Karl Popper's sort of core philosophy of science, which has been very widely accepted by scientists and by you know, many, many people as sort of part of the very definition of what we mean by a scientific approach to things. Well, the thesis that human cognition is digitally encodable is not falsifiable if you believe Shannon's channel capacity theorem. Because any measurement that we make of human cognition will only convey a finite number of bits. So we can never measure uh, anything about cognition that's gonna give us more than a finite number of bits. Um, but to falsify the thesis, we would have to show that there's more than a finite number of bits in human cognition. So you can't construct that experiment, okay? So what that really means from a practical perspective is that if you believe that you will be able to upload your cognition to a computer, you're free to believe that, but you should acknowledge that you're taking it on faith. And um, if you actually go through the experiment of doing that upload, uh, you may find, well, that you actually, it failed um, but actually, it may be completely unobservable that it failed. Maybe no one will know that it failed, okay? Yourself will have ceased to exist. Something will have emerged in the computer that maybe bears some resemblance with yourself. But is it actually yourself? There's no way to know. Fundamentally, you can't know. Okay, so this is one of the one of the arguments that I make, and th so this creates a real problem, I think, for the proponents of this thesis because, you know, it becomes a mathematical fact that that you can't actually know that this will work, unless you can invent a noiseless channel, right? So if you can figure out some way to convey information over over an absolutely perfect medium where there's no possibility of loss of information, but nobody knows how to do that. We have no physics that enables us to do that. And so, um, so th I think this, this really potentially shoots a hole in this particular aspect of the singularity because um, it creates a very, very fundamental core problem that, that uh, at least I don't see any way around that problem. Do, do you think that also renders projects by Elon Musk, such as Neuralink or uh, Brian Johnson's Kernel, the, these projects which aim to upgrade the human brain as a response to superintelligent AI that could potentially subsume us? Do you think that that exact uh, idea that you've just posited means that it may not even be possible to enhance the mind? Or might we find through that project that in actual fact this what thing, whatever it is, consciousness, intelligence, thinking, is the paragon. <laughs> Why might we just realize that there is nothing better than that? Well, actually, I think um, we can upgrade the human mind. In fact, we already have. Um, you know, as I say in the book, Google makes me smarter. Um, I, I think that, you know, the way we are using technology today does augment the human mind. And again, th this idea is not particularly new. This goes back to, to you know, Marshall McLuhan, who, who talked about, you know, technology as an extension of the human mind and, and an augmentation. And it's developed much more, um, you know, it's elaborated quite a bit by, by people like Daniel Dennett, um, who, you know, really say that these, that it has changed human thought and it has improved our capabilities. And I think that we see, we see it in, in the society. So if you just look at, I mean, I consider myself incredibly lucky to live when I do, right? My, my, my lifetime has been probably by historical standards um, the most peaceful period in human history, right? I mean, it's not been perfectly peaceful. We've had wars here and there, but you know, nothing like what 
all of humanity before me had to deal with. And I think that this is in part due to technology having improved the human brain. Um, we are, have somehow created societies that are far from perfect, but we make rational, logical decisions more often than we used to. And I think that we can credit in part, you know, the, the technology for that, the ability to communicate that we have, the ability we have to learn from one another. Um, you know, humans are, are, are really unique among animal species in that um, we're the only animal species who can learn from individuals that we've never met. Right? There's a lot of animal species that are certainly capable of, of teaching each other things, but there is no other species that learns from individuals they've never met. And that's an enormous magnifier of the human brain. That ability to learn from people we've never met is a magnifier. Although that ability, is, as you've written about, is arguably under threat by something that you call the information apocalypse, or more specifically, the Trumpian information apocalypse. So there is a, as our reliance on information increases, there's also a move towards controlling how that information's received. Could you explain that a little further? Yeah, that, that, that uh, idea is actually not in the book because I had finished the book before the Trumpian debacle happened. Um, for the most part, and the publisher wouldn't let me go back and rewrite major segments. Um, so, uh, but I, I posted a blog that Luke is referring to that, that it picks up on, on ideas from the book that um, are talking about the fact that there is a, a threat against this ability that we have to learn from people we've never met. That, in fact, um, you know, it used to be uh, not so long ago, you know, 20 years ago, we had um, authoritative sources of information and it was relatively expensive to disseminate information, right? You had to have printing presses, you had to have home delivery networks to deliver the New York Times to your front doorstep and, you know, stuff like that. And, and uh, information dissemination has gotten tremendously democratized. And uh, so, you know, anybody can speak to the entire world now, which, you know, if anything, creates more of a need for having authoritative sources of information, sources that we're willing to trust. And um, yet, you know, that it, when you when you see groups of people in in positions of considerable power, who seem to go about their daily lives trying to undermine the authority of these uh, trustworthy sources of information, that creates a very scary prospect because if you drive us towards a society where we lose this ability to learn from people we've never met, then we're not gonna be able to feed seven billion people on the planet anymore. Um, you know, if you can only learn from your neighbors and aren't gonna trust any of the, uh, any, any source that you haven't personally met, then uh, we're, we're doomed as a species. And it is truly disheartening that, you know, the, per, this person in the White House is uh, one of the primary um, people sort of pushing this, un, this uh, destructive agenda. Well, to return that idea back to AI, I mean, you talk about in that blog post, uh, when writing loses authority, we lose history and thought and reason. And if those things are lost, then if... AI is using information that's put out into the world to build its model of the world to then operate in the world, then what sort of models could it be building? What sort of flawed models could it be building? We're seeing these, for example, Twitter bots are placed out onto Twitter to scrape information and then create their own personalities. And what you find with, especially Microsoft's Tay bot, you, you get back reflections of humanity which aren't necessarily the most egalitarian positive things that come back as these racist robots running around tweeting nazi propaganda i mean when we have that issue are we training whatever it is that underlies and helps us and augments us to to be the worst of us well i 
Yes, uh, there is a there's. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it first, um, folks. <laughs> there, I mean, there's a there's a again there's huge risk here, and you know one of my worst nightmares. So I talk I talk in the book about the bots that are part of the immune system of Wikipedia, right? They they detect uh, vandalism and reverse vandalism, and they're they, you know they're they're fairly primitive AIs. They're not they're not the most sophisticated uh, pieces of software. And with today's technology, it would really be quite easy to write a piece of software that would defeat them and just systematically an AI that would go around editing Wikipedia pages and undermining the veracity of those Wikipedia pages by introducing subtle enough errors and misinformation here and there um, that, the, that the bots that are serving as the immune system would fail to catch them. And so you could get kind of an, an, an arms race happening there between the AIs that are, that are trying to protect the system and the AIs that are trying to destroy it, um, which is not a very pretty prospect. But, but we should also recognize the reality that if you think of these, of these technological artifacts more as living things and less as you know, just dispassionate sort of um, inert uh, objects, you realize that they are going to be vulnerable to disease. What, what, what do we mean by disease? Well, disease is any, is any, any process that kind of undermines the, the functioning of some, uh, of some process. We think of it as, you know, we think of disease as undermining metabolic processes, but um, why shouldn't we also include in disease things that undermine our cultural processes? Um, and if we treat them as disease, then we need to, you know, develop a kind of a, a theory of medicine to protect our, these cultural artifacts and to make sure that we can, in fact, um, um, you know, develop the countermeasures that are going to be necessary. We can't prevent the diseases from happening. They are going to happen. Um, as, you know, the technology spreads and becomes more important and controls more of the money flow in culture and the political flow, um, there it is, there are going to be, uh, disease like behaviors that are going to emerge and we're going to have to counter them. So in that case, what is the way in which we can most helpfully co-evolve with technology? Because what you're talking about happens at a, at a cultural scale. It's cultural evolution, not biological evolution. It happens within a generation, not across Generations. I mean, if that happened across generations, we'd expect to all evolve a hyperambidextrous thumb so we can all text faster. What we're talking about is something that is going to change within our generation. So how can we have a certain degree of responsibility to ensure we evolve the sorts of technology that we want? How do we make ourselves useful? Well, the short answer to that is I don't have the slightest idea. <laughs> okay. um, but... But one of my goals in kind of bringing these, these issues to the fore is that in order to, to address these, these risks, we need a much better understanding of what's actually going on. And I think that this, you know, this story of a competition between humans and, and AIs that who's, where the goal of the AIs is to obliterate the humans is that's not what's going on. And so if we have a better understanding of what's going on, I think we have a better chance of being able to nudge it in the right direction. We're never going to be able to control it. But what's going on is, is, is more of a competition, not between technology and humans, but between different types of technological stacks. To go back to this idea of survival of the fittest, one actually drives the survival of things like, as you, you mentioned, things like web browsers is consumer adoption and it kind of strikes me that that's a that's a false um or a forcing of the evolution of the survival of the fittest there's a lot of marketing and mimetic power behind hoping that certain silicon valley companies will survive over others Absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, if you, if you understand this as a, as a co-evolutionary process, right, you, you, you see that it is, it's not competition humans versus machines. It's alternative evolutions of technology and culture. 
that are competing with one another. And we do have the capability of nudging that process in various ways. So, you know, for example, you know, we can establish laws that will nudge things in a direction that we hope is beneficial. We can also establish laws that we hope will be beneficial that prove to be completely ineffective. So in the US, for example, we have privacy laws that basically result in, you know, a barrage of paper and a lot of fine print being sent around that nobody ever reads. I mean, these privacy laws are actually completely ineffective. They, they've just, you know, created this, all these privacy statements that really are doing nothing to protect anybody's privacy. And so it was an attempt to nudge the, the evolutionary process in a direction, but an ineffective attempt. And in a rapid evolutionary process, we have to fail fast, which unfortunately is very difficult for cultures, right? I mean, uh, we should recognize that the privacy laws as written right now are not working. We should abolish them and work on creating laws that might work more effectively. Um, that, those are the kinds of things I think we can probably do as, you know, if you want to be kind of an activist in this area, you, you need to be thinking about, well, how do we create how do we create the, the cultural machinery that will help to nudge the process in directions that are more favorable and, and less destructive? I mean, one really good example is, you know, as careers die, for example, what do we do with the people who get displaced, who lose work? Well, one cultural option we could do is just let them live on the street, right? That's the experiment that we're trying in the U.S. right now. And um, I don't think that's going to play out so well, uh, honestly. I, I don't think that's a good choice as a culture and a society for a way to deal with the death of careers. The thing I worry about when we use this term evolution is that it's not always survival of the fittest. It's sometimes survival of the mutant. It's sometimes the things that we don't expect that actually survive beyond the things that we kind of assume will because environment changes or something else changes and and it also evolution to a degree has no ethical framework and what we're asking to do if we're evolving technology is to to enforce a human ethical framework upon it which ensures at least at the very very least our survival so i wonder if evolution is the right framing or the right term to use when describing technology well, I, I mean, you, you, you raise a very good point, and it's, uh, it's you know, in, in a way, sur survival of the fittest is uh, actually a little bit of a misrepresentation of what Darwinian evolution really is about, because it, it has less to do with fitness and has more to do with procreative power, that the things that survive are the ones that replicate, the ones that are able to spread. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the, they're more fit uh, in any sort of objective sense than the things that got a, that lost out in that competition, right? You can have more procreative power for all kinds of reasons that are not ethical and not have nothing to do with any sort of end goal and anything that we might even define as as fitness in in some sense. So fitness, the, the idea of fitness sort of imposes a value judgment there that isn't there in an evolutionary process. But the fact that this evolutionary process has humans so deeply involved and that it's happening at the cognitive level of humans, not at the biological level, means that we can use ethical judgment to, you know, help define the procreative capabilities of the various technologies. We can outlaw technologies, and of course that doesn't eliminate them perfectly, but, you know, I mean, as of today, apparently there are, you know, uh, Republicans in the U.S. that are considering outlawing this, uh, this bump gun stock that um, was used in Las Vegas to, to convert a semi-automatic weapon into a fully automatic weapon. Um, no such law will be perfect, you know, there will always be these devices that will leak through. But by creating laws, we can make things better. And 
the same is true with the technological evolution that we have we we have quite a bit of power to nudge this process and we're never going to do it perfectly we always have to do it with with humility right um and we we need to fail fast when we you know try something and it doesn't work let's try something else what is is that idea of failing which which fills me with a, not a degree of dread but a Look, I, I'm very open to risk, but it does feel like we need the Las Vegas equivalent within AI before we start paying attention to it. You keep using this term fail, and I just wonder how much blood needs to be spilt before these issues really come to the foreground and they escape the basements of the library club and enter the, the uh, uh, general populace and the conversation in the general populace. Well, let me, let me turn that idea around, right? Because, I mean, you, you know, we can focus on the negative things that could evolve um, from the technology that we might have been able to prevent through policy. Let me turn it around and talk about positive things that could evolve from technology that we are preventing through policy. Okay, so in, in the last chapter of my book, I, I tell a little story about how uh, I um, was out on the street one day and I saw a, a flatbed truck that had uh, uh, a, a car that it just had pulled off the street that had the whole front end of the car smashed up. Okay. Obviously the car had been involved in a rear end collision and had run into a truck in front of it or a car in front of it or something. And um, it was a pretty new car. It was a you know late model car where, you know, made in the last couple of years. And my immediate reaction was, that car should be ashamed of itself. Um, there is really no excuse for putting cars on the road today that will happily run into the car in front of them at 120 kilometers per hour. There is no excuse for it. We have the technology to, at very, very modest cost, make cars that will not do that. So why aren't we doing that? Why are the car companies still putting cars on the road that will happily run into the car in front of them? Well, we have all this, all this cultural machinery around liability laws and insurance and uh, sort of this whole established way of dealing with car accidents, which are a, rea a reality in our culture, okay? And all of that machinery is keeping the car companies from deploying this technology. The car companies cite, you know, their uncertainty about the liability laws and how the, what are the implications, you know, wh wh who's going to be at fault? It be, it, it might become the car company that, that is at fault when there's a rear end collision instead of the driver of the car. And, and they don't want that. So I think that my, you know, I can make a prediction right here. I think that particular aspect is going to change, but it's going to change because somebody is going to sue Ford or BMW for, um, you know, their daughter was killed by a car that ran into the back of the, of her car. And, um, they're going to sue the car company because the car company knew how to prevent that and they didn't prevent it. And they could have prevented it for a very modest cost, but they didn't. And it, it's going to require that lawsuit to get this to change, to get the technology deployed so that we actually make cars that won't do stupid things like run into the car in front of them. So that turns it around, right? Because that says, well, you know, we can we can also be doing cultural things that are that are hurting us, uh, you know, by preventing deployment of technology that could clearly help us. So on that note, I want to open it out to questions. And if I can ask Graham, I'm going to throw you a microphone. Does anybody have any uh, glaring questions or concerns with relation to what's been said? Cheers, Graham. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank you. Um, it was mind-blowing. Um, and I have a few questions, actually. Um, I'll just put them out there. And you see... Um, Give them to me one at, one at a time, because otherwise I will forget <laughs> Perfect. them. Perfect. Let's do that. <laughs> so I think taking from the last thing um, that you said about human culture, um, I think... Personally, human culture is very slow um, at adapting 
um, and that doesn't go well with the pace of technological evolution. Um, and that's probably one of the reasons that um, there's so many clashes between um, structures that have been put into place, like for example with car companies um, and technological evolution. And the same could be said about um, urban environments, for example in London. Um, there are ways to have less toxic air around us, but we're not doing anything about it, and we know it's damaging all of us, but that's still not changing. Um, so do you think we will, at some point, be dependent on techno technology, whether it's AI, um, a techno, um, techno species of some sort, um, to help us fasten our cultural behaviors and adaptability to it. In other words, do you think we've, we're going to re reach a point where we realize we've messed up so much that we're going to relinquish our responsibility to something other that we perceive to be more intelligent or more um, noble than us? Well, uh, I, think, I think there is real risk of ceding authority to these AIs before they have really demonstrated the competence that would justify ceding that authority to them. And so, you know, we have to work to not do that. Um, and I, I think it's going to be a difficult thing to do. And uh, honestly, I don't have any silver bullet. I mean, your, your, your point about the fact that our culture changes slowly, I think if anything, that should be helpful in this process rather than hurtful because, because the technology development itself is also a cultural phenomenon. I mean, that's one of the points that I make in this book. I talk about the idiosyncratic, you know, um, programming uh, community with their, you know, way of doing things that can often be frustratingly conservative where they will cling to, to ideas that many people might consider old fashioned. And so even the technologi technological development actually gets slowed down by the, the, you know, the, the fact that, that cultural phenomena don't spread so quickly. And so I think that can put a dampening effect. We don't want, uh, in an evolutionary process, you know, very, very rapid change is really dangerous, right? And so things that slow it down some can be quite helpful. Um, and I think, you know, we do have those. And I think one of the, maybe one of the major ones is simply um, the fact that humans will cling to their unknown knowns much beyond the usefulness of those unknown knowns, which puts a dampening effect on the progress. Um, by progress, progress is a dangerous word here, right? I mean, by progress, I just mean change. I don't mean necessarily something that is moving towards something better. So any other questions at all? Just behind you. <coughs> Sorry. Hello. Hello. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much for, for that. Um, I'm, I'm actually a great deal more pessimistic um, than you are. Um, let's just stick to Google is that I don't actually use Google, although I'm a technologist. Um, one of my problems about this is actually ownership, um, therefore ownership and motive. Um, for example, it's become fairly clear over the last few days that Google, in its um, crusade for true information, has actually managed to suppress a lot of um, alternative left-wing websites. Um, that might be right or it might be wrong, but you know it's a it's a private institution that's decided that. So that's one thing. Um, second thing that goes with that a bit is I'm also a pessimistic uh, pessimist about current AI as well, because current AI in the main isn't it's machine learning, it's ML, and therefore it's optimization. If that optimization 
is again, you know, let's say in the hands of Google, in the hands of Facebook, whatever, um, you've then got algorithms that are deciding things, that are feeding things that are not at all transparent. You know, you may be dis missing data that's going in there. You don't know actually, you know, how the thing's being trained, what it's decided. So, sorry to to strike such a sour note, but there we are. <laughs> Well, so, yeah, so, there, I mean, there's two points there, and I'm struggling. I, I wish you'd give them to me one at a time, because I'll try to remember. Sorry. But, <laughs> um, but I mean, the, 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 first, the first one uh, about, about suppression of information, um, you compare where we are to the 1950s, when, in the U.S. at least, we had three television networks that controlled all of the information dissemination. Okay. Talk about suppression of information, and you realize immediately that, wow, we are much better off now. No matter how much you think that there is, of course there is suppression of information, um, but nothing like there used to be. In fact, the, the fluidity of information today is unprecedented. And the fact is that people can have a voice uh, like never before in human history. So, so on that one, I... I agree that we keep, want to keep nudging the process towards more fluid information flow. We want to keep doing that. But our trajectory has been pretty damn good. Um, the second point is the one about transparency. Um, I don't think that the algorithms involved in AI are actually comprehensible to anybody. Okay? So I don't think transparency is going to help. I, I think that looking at the code is not going to help you understand what comes out of it. And so the idea of just making it more transparent is a, a bit of an illusion. It may, not actually, uh, it may not actually help achieve the objective. I think your objective is, is, is valid, right? We, we should be suspicious of organizations that get too much power. That's a very important part of what we need to be doing as a culture. And we need to be, you know, constraining the power that those institutions have so that, you know, it doesn't uh, uh, do things that we wouldn't like. There's a wonderful book that I should recommend. It'll really feed your, uh, your pessimism. Uh, uh, it's a book by David Eggers called The Circle. Have you read that? Yeah, I mean, it's fabulous because, um, you know, one of the things that, that David Eggers does in this book is he lays out a story where um, there's a cultural technology coevolution. He doesn't call it that, right? But, but that's really what's going on in this book, where every decision that's made by the technologists in this company called The Circle, which is kind of a mashup of, you know, Google, Facebook, Apple, all in one, um, this, in this company called The Circle, every decision they seem to be making is a, what I personally would have considered a very laudable decision. For example, you know, uh, politicians should be fully transparent. We should be able to see everything that they do. <laughs> but the consequences that play out from these each individual seemingly laudable decisions are just incomprehensibly horrible. And... There, so, you know, I mean, transparency is not necessarily going to help because, you know, under, you, you know seeing, seeing the algorithms, seeing the code is not necessarily going to tell you what the consequences are going to be that are going to emerge from the use of that code. Any other questions at all? One just did. Um, it kind of connects, but it's kind of from a... Is that, it doesn't matter, it's small. <laughs> Can you hear me? Or, yes. Yeah. Um, it kind of connects to the point that you're, you were making a bit, but um, I suppose I, I'm concerned about talking about AI from the point of view of it as a biological um, kind of system. But I see kind of these processes more as kind of an architecture or a, a kind of platform for the way that we might sociologically evolve. And I wonder, it's, it's interesting hearing you speak in a, a way which kind of separates that notion of a sociological kind of contract that might be associated to how we, we um, apply technology. Um, and I, it's, it's, um, 
I suppose that kind of connects to the way that we might see technology as a way of extending bodies or extending ways of, of um, evolution rather than a biological process in its own right. Um, and I, it's, it's interesting that Tay kind of came up in that because, um, again, Tay's a really good example of maybe the kind of fault in that system. So um, part of the reason Tay didn't work was... So I'm sorry, what... what Tay, what, the... Um, actually, have I called it the wrong... What, what is Tay? Tay, was she, it Tay? She was the... Well, she... she it was the it was racist Tay, wasn't it? M Microsoft So the, the Microsoft Twitter, Twitter bot. Oh, right, that one. Yeah, yeah okay. so it, it came up earlier. Um, part of the reason that it didn't work was that it was a misunderstanding of how the structure of conversation might work. So the idea of a conversation as having a system of, of rewards and goals, when actually Actually, human conversation is sometimes goalless, sometimes meandering, sometimes um, has, you know, is preliminary, it's noises. And, and to teach an AI that is, is impossible. And I, I suppose that connects to the idea of um, AI as a mimic. But then is that true biology to think about AI as mimicry rather than products? And it's, it kind of belies the idea of the human hand in, in creating the AI. And I, I'm not, I'm not, dis, I'm not um, discrediting what you're saying. I, I totally agree and find it fascinating. But I, I wonder if there's, that's the complication in trying to sort of define the, the idea of um, AI as an evolution because it's, it, it kind of is, is and it isn't. I don't know if that was yeah. a question or an observation. It well, was sort of um, a statement. I don't know. Well, it's, I mean, it's, I, I find what you're saying, you know, very deep and, and difficult to get my head around. Uh, but I, I think you're, you, uh, I, I do want to say that I, I don't consider uh, AIs as being separate from humans. And in fact, that's one of the, one of the points that I develop in the book is um, this idea that when you you know have digital information and you've got this machine that is manipulating digital information, the digital information by itself um, has no meaning. It has no significance, right? So you can you can have processes that are just sort of transforming bits, but that does nothing, right? I mean, it's actually just burning energy, right? There's no function there. The only the only way that it acquires any function is when it connects with humans who attach some meaning to those bits and we certainly see this in in you know the effective uses of ai that we have already so you know for example when you know i ask google for you know a, a question for something google doesn't produce for me something synthesized by an ai google produces for me something that was written by humans Okay, and so that's a very different kind of mechanism, right? And I think that's the kind of mechanism that we're gonna be seeing a lot more. And so I think your point that we shouldn't be thinking of these as separate beings is, is really an important one. And, and I don't really think of them as separate. I think that they are absolutely intertwined with humanity and with human thought. But also human innovation, and I think there's... And also with human innovation. Yeah, so, I yes. mean, how different is AI processes from the spinning jenny, for example, in terms of how it it's mechanizes or, or allows us to realize a different kind of social contract? And I think it's, it's interesting that we're talking about car... Um, cars kind of came up quite a lot and that, that in the 50s there was a huge change in the way that uh, huge numbers of workers were put out of work for, for um, mechanized approaches. So I, I think it's, it's easy to kind of, uh, I don't, I, I, yeah, I'm losing my point, but I suppose it's, it's, it, it's uh, the progress is, is more linear than maybe we sometimes like to think it is, or maybe other people disagree. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, w I wonder to, to that question about it being linear. So, you, you say, again, it's in the blog post rather than the book about um, God being a mathematician and then he was a computer scientist. And what are we going to see next? He's a quantum physicist. I mean, is there that sort of linear progression as we learn more about the world through science and technology or techno science? 
do we change our metaphors and do we change our ways of, of viewing the world? And maybe we're just not there yet. I mean, it's a great place to live right now and everything's a, everything's a computer, but tomorrow everything could be a quantum computer or something else. Well, actually, I mean, one of the, one of the points that I advocate for in the book is a little bit of humility about what we can know. Um, and, uh, that's, you know, something that I think we, we just have to constantly keep that in mind, right? That, um, in fact, um, I talk a bit about, you know, classic results like, um, like, you know, Alan Turing's, uh, inability to his, you know, demonstration that we can't, in fact, completely analyze all computer programs. So you could have, you know, computer programs that actually there's no way that you can say important things about their properties that we'd like to be able to say, but you actually can't say them. And, and similarly, Kurt Gödel's incompleteness theorems about, you know, mathematical models, that there's, there's holes in all of these theories. And the fact is that the things that we can say, the things that we can, you know, claim to understand by giving explanations of, are probably a very, very small subset of what is really happening in the universe. And so we need some humility, right? We're not going to be able to understand all this stuff. And this is also through the lens of the limitation of human cognitive ability, which is the, the real issue. There's another question just here. Um, yeah, hi. Uh, thank you. I, I, actually, maybe there are two two questions which actually kind of overlap with, with the sort of questions. I think there's a circling. It's like <laughs> you've left me with more questions than I, I would ever imagine. So first of all, I'm sort of thinking um, in terms of kind of this point of being superhuman. Actually, it's uh, with AI, it seems to be going in a particular direction when actually I don't even know if everyone has exactly the same understanding of what it is to be human and also what being the best part of being human is like a lot of people would say success which would generally be like baby ba based upon power or money uh, a a acquisition of goods or something like this um, and so then it comes down to this kind of idea of economics which then well if that's the reason that AI seems to be going in and obviously it's powered by the economic structure which is already in place then it kind of runs into a sort of thing of like technology is being built in the environment that uh, post capitalism instead of maybe thinking about looking at developing a like a community of something else but then who would fund that so it, again, if you're thinking about where culture is headed, and I think this would be the darker side of possibly like looking at uh, data acquisition and so on, and, and how maybe like data and the oil or something like this, it's like, well, actually, where does that leave? Where does that leave community? Um, where does it leave care? I don't know, maybe part of being human is being flawed, <laughs> you know? And so then it brings in a whole other thing of like, well, okay, well, is it always about um, only success and not about failure? Is it failure to have medical conditions or, you know? And, and, and so the, these kind of discourses seem to be uh, pretty much shut off maybe, or maybe I just don't know enough people working in AI to, to sort of understand that. And then it also seems that it's looking towards human intelligence, but what about, what about the fact that we're all into beings and we're sort of all interconnected? So like, I don't know, like, how about learning from algae or learning from these other things that are sort of part of us? I know you say they don't maybe have intelligence, but there's certainly something that, I don't know, like producing oxygen, taking away carbon dioxide in the act, you know, that's like plankton and all of this stuff. It works with us. But at the moment, what we seem to be doing with technology is actually destroying rather than like, you know, you, I think you brought up symbiosis, which a lot of people are talking about, but it's also, it's not just about us and technology, it's about the whole environment, <laughs> right down to the bacteria, up to the, you know, so it's... So, I mean, you, you're, you're raising a whole bunch of issues that I think are, are really uh, interesting and thought-provoking, and I could uh, react to several of them, but, um, you know, one of them is, I, I, I think you're right that... Um, I freely admit that 
I at least don't understand humans. That's uh, kind of what I mean when I you know, talk about being a self-professed nerd. I, I really don't. And I honestly believe that most people don't, although I think most people probably understand humans better than I do. But, um, but one of the things that is happening with the development of AI is that it is forcing some introspection on this question of what it means to be human that is put, putting, shedding some new light on that. And so, I mean, one of the, there are people within the AI community whose goal it is to replicate human intelligence, not because they think that will be useful or saleable or anything like that, but to them it's a scientific enterprise that is part of an investigation of what human intelligence actually is. And I can see some validity in doing that because I think, you know, the better we can understand ourselves, the better we're going to be able to nudge things along. But, you know, you talked about economics driving things, but what is economics? I mean, what is money, right? Money is a completely social construct. Um, it's, it's an agreement that we have as a society uh, to treat this, these abstract things that used to be, you know, paper, and now they're just bits in computers. And um, we use them as a, a medium of exchange. They have no intrinsic value whatsoever. Um, and yet they're absolutely essential to the functioning of our society. And so there's an example of where, you know, the very humanity that we have, the fact that you guys are all in this room and, you know, has depended on and the fact that I'm in this room has depended on my ability to use my credit card to, you know, get a, um, a, a ticket for the underground because uh, I didn't change any money. So I didn't have any pounds. And, um, you know, so we're absolutely intertwined with these completely abstract human constructed concepts that are nevertheless governing everything that we do. So, for example, with those systems, um, what I was going to say is, I, I think with oh, was it with regard to sort of privacy or something like this, you're saying, well, there are laws that are then put, put in, but it always seems to be that it's like the it's like the afterthought rather than building the system that has the ethics in place in the first place, which somehow seems a cleverer, smarter thing to do. I don't know, but then why why is that not happen? Like, wh is that um, basically due to ec like economics? So these companies, tech companies, exact that's how they're making money. So they're not going to think about these things. And it's like, sod it, we'll leave it to government. They're crap, <laughs> you know? And so then it's like these laws. And no one's going to read the T and, like, TNC for like, yeah, like you say, 30 pages. And it's either like avoid all of these things and maybe get left behind in some way or, or yeah. build these things better. If you, if you don't know, Edward, we've just lost Uber in London, so half yes, these people I, aren't I, getting I, home tonight. <laughs> so I, I know I, I I I read about that, but I, you know, honestly, I have enormous admiration for London cabbies. So it's, uh, I mean, I think they're they're kind of amazing. But um, it, I think that we can't. It's I think it's an oversimplification to just you know blame greed uh, for all of this. I think that 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 isn't really all that useful uh, a perspective on, on it. I think it's, I think what's really happening is a lot more complex than that. And, and the fact is that, you know, if you, if you understand that uh, the, how deeply intertwined technology becomes in our culture, I mean, speaking of Uber, I had this, this really weird experience. I think the first time I rode an, an Uber was in uh, Washington, DC. And, you know, I conjure this thing up on my phone and, and this little, you know, blip comes to where I'm standing and, you know, car pulls up in front of me and I get into the car and the, the, the driver has this, um, you know, his own phone mounted to the dashboard and the phone is telling him what to do. And I realized that he was just the sensor system for this big computer, um, that they hadn't figured out how to make the the computer see out the windshield of the car effectively enough to drive the car yet right and so they needed a human to to be the sensor system and to do the the kind of low level control to keep the car from running into pedestrians but the but the human was actually just following the orders of, from the computer and he was just a cog in this in this wheel uh, i mean he was a cog in this big machine and um you know just 
functioning at a very low level as this, this sensor system to compensate for, you know, technology that the computer didn't have yet. Um, that made it kind of obvious why Uber is working on self-driving technology, right? Because the fact is that, that, you know, the drivers are just following orders from these algorithms and performing functions that they haven't figured out how to reliably do with machines yet. But those are just filling in gaps in the overall system. But essentially, it's sort of set up again. You sort of say it's not about greed, but it was set up really as this. It was. Got, I think there are a few articles on sort of the lies of this sharing economy, you know, and it's made out that it's all this very convenient thing. But actually, like I don't know, coming from a trade union background as well, it's like actually no, it's about it is about people's jobs, and yeah, as easily as you see someone, you realise it's like self-driving cars. Everyone's going to be. Yeah, if you view it more as a as a uh, uh, a coevolution. Right then, instead of thinking of it as greed, um, what you realize is that the the technological artifacts that survive are the ones that provide value to the humans who will then nurture and develop those technological artifacts. Right. So if you if you start a company that's based on some software and your company fails, the software will die. Right. If you start a company that is based on software and your company succeeds and makes money, then the software doesn't die, right? So from a Darwinian evolution perspective, the software that survives is going to be the software that has provided profits to some humans because those humans are necessary in order to nurture that software. So that's the, the, the force that is happening is more a Darwinian force than, than greed. And greed is just a mechanism that is actually more a culturally defined mechanism because money itself is a culturally defined mechanism. So it's a mechanism that is certainly an essential part of that Darwinian feedback loop. But the real process that's going on is this Darwinian coevolution. We have time for one more question. I'm trying to go up the back somewhere. Uh, Cahill? Yeah, I'm going to give you... Hi. Um, so I, I definitely agreed with your point that it's in some ways kind of maybe redundant on a functional basis to try and replicate human cognition kind of digitally with 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 the growing AI. Um, but you're talking about having to or trying to perpetuate this uh, symbiotic kind of um, codependence and co-benefit. Do you think it will get to a point where it's harder for us to maintain the need? That, the, that, that technology has for us? Because at the moment, it needs us to maintain it and it needs us to use it. But do you think it will get to a point where it, it, it doesn't need us and we become, well, kind of like the parasite rather than a, a symbiote? Um, uh, all I can say is I hope not. <laughs> um, but I, can I say that won't happen? No, I, I, it, it very well could. I, I certainly hope it doesn't happen. Um, I think that in a way, you know, the, the history, the, the, if, to the extent that the biological metaphor works, which of course is limited, um, history is on our side, right? I mean, we, we, we've seen a lot of symbiotic uh, coevolution happen in biology that's been very effective, where, you know, the algae doesn't kill the lichen, uh, 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 or the algae doesn't kill the fungus in lichen, right? Or, or the fungus kill the algae. So, and, you know, gut bacteria in humans is a very asymmetric version of that where, you know, both are thriving, right? I mean, the fact that there's 7 billion humans on the planet has been hugely beneficial to the gut bacteria as a species, right? Um, so... You know, there's lots of examples in biology where symbiosis has not led to an annihilation. But it can happen. I, I almost see that as kind of getting back to where you were. It won't be the AI that causes this real issue. It would be, be Gaia or whatever this, this earthly thing is may realize that we're a cancer on it in a very Jim Lovelock uh, sense. I want the final question to be... In what way, Edward, do you think that 
human creativity might be the thing that ensures our continuation? Well, I, yes, I think uh, there's a number of ways to view human creativity and its role in all of this. I mean, the, the sort of dispassionate objective one is that there, that human creativity is just the source of randomness in the evolutionary process. Every evolutionary process needs a m mechanism for creating mutations, and human creativity may be that mechanism. And, but my opinion is that even if that's true, um, you know, from the perspective of humans, we are, you know, we are the ones who attach value to any of these things, right? Through ethics, through, you know, aesthetics, through whatever value system we have, the, you know, caring about other human beings, for example, is a tremendous force that is, uh, you know, uh, intrinsic part of our value system. Um, that value system is, is very human and you know the creativity involved in this driving this mutational process um we do i hope we will continue to attach uh value to it human value to it and prefer um creative uh Prefer, prefer certain forms of creativity over other forms of creativity, right? I mean, either, you know, there's a lot of things that are creative that we think of as, we, we might not think of as creative, right? I mean, uh, you know, in, in 2001, um, uh, a bunch of guys invented a new way to, uh, uh, a new form of warfare, right? When they, when September 11th happened, right? By, taking over airplanes and nobody thought they were going to do that. That was creative, but not in a way that we would, you know, value in the same sense that we might usually, um, want a creative force to affect us. Right. But you can't argue it wasn't creative. They really did. They invented a whole new way of, of attacking the U S that nobody thought, nobody thought of that before. Right, so creativity by itself isn't intrinsically a good thing, um, but the value systems that we impose on it can can make it a very good thing. So on that note, I hope that you now feel like you're prepared for the Googleian explosion of the techno species. And just a couple of thank yous. I want to thank the Library Club for hosting us. Um, we're excited to continue our relationship with uh, this fabulous venue. That they they truly are incredible. Um, we're hopefully locking in a couple more dates across this year and, and 2018. And um, I think it's impossible for me to overstate how lucky we are uh, to to be in this venue. Uh, they do an incredible job. Um, on another note, uh, books, uh, Plato and the Nerd, can be published, uh, uh, sorry, published, can be purchased at the back from MIT Press. There's a, there's a member of MIT Press just at the back by the bar uh, with a bunch of books. If you um, if you do want to take a look at some of the other concepts that uh, Edward has so wonderfully shared with us um, this evening. And I also want to thank our volunteers uh, for helping us tonight. Uh, Graham's an incredible cyborg artist in his own right. And uh, his his colleague as well is an interesting filmmaker. So do go talk to them. And if you like what we do, please support us on uh, Patreon. We're entirely audience uh, funded. Uh, you can find out more about Virtual Futures by following at Virtual Futures pretty much everywhere uh, online. If you've had taken any images or you have any thoughts from this evening, please do tweet them on the hashtag VF Salon. And we also have a podcast. Uh, we released a new episode this morning with Rachel Botsman, who's just released a new book on trust. So please check that out. It's available literally everywhere. Um, and I want to end with this, which is how we always end virtual futures, which to a degree is a warning. And it's this, the future is always virtual. And some things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not predicated on our capacity for prediction. Although, and in those much more rare occasions, something remarkable does come of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that this evening. Please join me in thanking the incredible Edward A. Lee. The bar is now open.